Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Global Health Summit. I'm Jeff Flyer, Dean of the Harvard Medical School, and it's really a great honor and a pleasure to introduce this event that is co-hosted uh, by the Brigham and Women's Hospital, the Harvard School of Public Health, and Harvard Medical School. It's also a personal privilege for me to share the stage with researchers and teachers and physicians and leaders who have made such remarkable contributions to the improvement of global health. Betsy Nabel has spoken eloquently about the Brigham's commitment to combining world-class healthcare delivery with education and research to effectively confront the challenges that face global healthcare providers. And her actions as president of the Brigham and Women's Hospital speak even more clearly than her words. It was Dr. Nabel's idea to convene this summit, bringing together our three institutions to celebrate our shared mission and to highlight the many accomplishments of our faculty who work together to further the goals of global health. Many thanks, Betsy, for your dedication to this critical work. Julio Frank, also a leading scholar and practitioner of global health at the highest national and international levels, has, during his tenure as the dean of the Harvard School of Public Health, supported research, policies, and practices that will make a great contribution to alleviating human suffering caused by disease, which is the part of our shared mission of our three institutions. Those of us who speak about the changing world of 21st century medicine and biomedical research commonly highlight the value of collaboration, bringing together distinct experts with perspectives that vary and work together to build effective teams. And global health is without a doubt one of the most highly collaborative fields in biomedicine, with researchers based at top academic medical centers working hand in hand with community health workers in some of the most resource challenged settings in the world. If you think of global health as a team sport, the community represented here today by our three institutions along with our healthcare colleagues in countries such as Haiti, Rwanda, and India, and others, together constitute a dream team dedicated to exploring and sharing solutions and implementing effective systems that save lives. One of the key challenges facing, facing global health leadership is the shortage of highly qualified healthcare professionals in low and middle income countries. And many of the key collaborations between our three institutions are focused on alleviating this shortage. In November of 2012, Harvard Medical School announced its participation in Human Resources for Health, a consortium of nearly two dozen US medical schools allied health professional schools and affiliated institutions, all deciding to work together with the aim of building a self-sustaining medical education system in Rwanda, an initiative led by that nation's Ministry of Health. And I can tell you this was not an easy thing to bring about. There were many, many, many months of uh, conversations about how this could be carried out. The country has made a commitment to such efforts, and Rwanda has had an impressive health transformation in the past two decades, doubling life expectancy and achieving broad health coverage. The goal of Human Resources for Health is to train the next generation of Rwandan healthcare professionals in a variety of specialties so that they, in turn, can train succeeding generations. And the goal is to reach self-sufficiency in health education within seven years. HMS, the Brigham, and its faculty members have been key collaborators in this program, sending surgeons, anesthesiologists, and internal medicine specialists to work alongside Rwandan colleagues, laying the foundation for a truly transformative medical system there. HMS has also re recently launched a new Masters of Medical Sciences program in global health delivery, designed to provide practitioners with a diverse set of tools and the flexibility and creativity necessary to use these skills in the most challenging settings imaginable. The program grew out of a pre-existing collaboration between the medical school and the School of Public Health, the Global Health Delivery Intensive Program. It relies on faculty from the medical school, the School of Public Health, the Harvard Business School, and the Faculty of Arts and Sciences to help students develop skills and disciplines such as quantitative analysis and management while also deepening their foundation in the ethical and historical context of global health delivery. In all, 170 people from dozens of countries have graduated from the Global Health Effectiveness Program, and the graduates include the head of Kenya's 
National AIDS and Sexually Transmitted Infections Control Program, and the former president of Médecins Sans Frontières International Council. The course is now also being taught in Rwanda, broadening the reach of the program beyond our Longwood campus. Of course, in addition to sharing our knowledge with colleagues around the world, we have also much to learn about the best ways to treat diseases and deliver care wherever it's needed. And here in the United States, our own healthcare system is straining under the burden of rising costs, while too many in our communities are left without adequate access to care. The burden of disease in low and middle income countries has also shifted radically in recent years and not entirely for the better. Dean Frank calls this the triple burden. While progress has been made on the diseases of poverty, scourges such as undernutrition and diarrheal disease continue to claim lives. In populations with longer lifespans, deaths from non-communicable diseases and injuries are on the rise. The threat of diseases of globalization, such as HIV and avian flu, looms larger than ever because of increasingly mobile populations. Now, despite all this, the situation is not entirely bleak. We also have creative, inspired, and inspiring colleagues around the world that we can, that we must collaborate with and learn from. Some of the care delivered in resource-poor settings is not merely good people doing their best under tough circumstances. It's world-class, gold-standard care delivery. We would do well in Boston to match the levels of drug adherence and home-based care delivery that many patients with chronic illnesses in Rwanda have available today. Today, our first panel focuses on some of the lessons that we've learned from our experiences as we've worked to improve standards of health around the globe. Our speakers will impart their insights, sharing with us a sampling of creative, high-impact interventions that span the full spectrum of care from community-based primary care to affordable cardiac surgery to international responses to humanitarian and natural disasters. So I think at this moment we'll move on to our first panelist. At my right, uh, Michael Van Royen, director of the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. Professor Van Royen is also director of the Division of International Health and Humanitarian Programs in the Department of Emergency Medicine at the Brigham. He's also a professor in the Department of Global Health and Population at the School of Public Health and a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School. Dr. Van Royen has worked extensively in humanitarian assistance in dozens of countries affected by war and disaster, including Somalia, Bosnia, Rwanda, Iraq, North Korea, Darfur, Chad, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. He served both as a physician and a policy advisor with numerous relief organizations. And domestically, he's helped many, many projects, including coordinating the American Red Cross public health response to Hurricane Katrina and helped send more than 20 physicians from our Harvard system to hurricane-devastated re regions. Dr. Van Royen teaches courses in humanitarian operations in war at the Harvard School of Public Health, and his textbook, Emergency Field Medicine, is considered one of the key reference texts in this area. So we'll ask Dr. Van Royen to make some comments. Uh, thank you, Dean Flyer, and uh, thank you, um, President Nabel, and uh, Dean Frank for putting this on and for hosting us. And thank you to my panelists for sharing the stage. Um, we're gonna do things in a very, we were instructed to sit here and to sit here and to do our <laughs> discussion. So uh, we'll do so to make it kind of conversational. So we'll, uh, we'll take care of that. Although the, you know, the, the, uh, the lifeline of the podium is not there. So we'll see what we can do. Um, so thank you very much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about it. My field um, is in international humanitarian assistance in war, conflict and disaster. And, um, I think the events of the Philippines or the ongoing events in Syria, for example, can um, kind of give you a good example and, uh, and a clear example of the importance of humanitarian aid, why population rescue and why marshalling um, humanitarian assistance in war and conflict needs to happen quickly, needs to happen in a large scale, and needs to happen uh, with some degree of quality and coordination, and doesn't necessarily happen in all of those ways. Um, as an emergency physician at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, I'm, I'm proud of the fact that uh, we, our emergency department is the safety net for the community. Um, we are there for bad things that happen to people, whether it's a car accident or a, 
uh, an MI or a stroke or even the events of the, uh, the Boston Marathon bombing, you know, we're there and we appreciate and the, the resources that we have to have our team care for people in our emergency department. Well, as a, a humanitarian physician, um, I see the humanitarian relief field kind of to, to global health as the ER of global health. And that is the goal of humanitarian assistance in war and conflict and disaster is different than development, right? It's different than the rest, just like emergency medicine is different than the rest of the, the healthcare system. Humanitarian assistance is different than development in many ways. Um, and it requires a different skill set, a uh, different discipline, and a different kind of approach. Um, in these few minutes, I'd like to point out kind of uh, make an argument, essentially. So um, give you a, a few features of the humanitarian aid community and then end with why I think there's a place for Harvard and a place for academics in, the, in this really complicated, weird, uh, busy world of, the, of humanitarian assistance. The first issue is that humanitarian aid is crucial. The second is that humanitarian aid is unique. The third is that humanitarian aid is, believe it or not, imperfect. Uh, and fourth, that some key investments in strategic uh, leverage points can really change the field of humanitarian assistance. So first, um, that humanitarian aid is crucial. Um, if we see anything from the large population movements in Syria, for example, or in the Philippines, or our work in Haiti, or in, in many other countries around the world, we see the tremendous sort of de-developmental effects of, of humanitarian catastrophes. So it's not just that people die of direct causes. It's not that people are swept away in a tsunami or that die in a collapsed building or that are shot in Syria. But the humanitarian sort of consequences of the aid environment um, and, and what happens to a population it goes well, well beyond the population. So disasters affect populations, but they also destroy health systems. They destroy economies. They destroy social structures. They destroy safety and safety of communities. And the humanitarian aid industry, really, is designed around population stabilization and to find ways to get a population kind of back to normal, or at least back to a place where they can conceive of normal. So the aid industry, as a, as a part of the global health enterprise and the global aid enterprise, is a crucial feature and an important one. Um, the second argument, I guess, that I'd like to make is that um, humanitarian aid is unique. And in so providing humanitarian assistance is not just a matter of providing food or water or health care or sanitation services or protection, but you're doing so in the most constrained environment with the most highly vulnerable populations in the most difficult circumstances. So it's the difference between working in, say, Somalia compared to Tanzania, right? The, 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 the political structures, the economies, the base of operations in Tanzania is entirely different than Somalia. And it requires a different level of engagement and a different level of risk, actually. And so uh, I believe that the humanitarian aid field is its unique discipline, very much like we have medical disciplines of emergency medicine. The aid community is a unique discipline and, it's, and it requires a unique understanding, a unique evidence base, and a unique sort of approach to training. Um, the third point is that aid is imperfect. This would shock you to realize that aid agencies may not coordinate with each other well. They may be somewhat wasteful sometimes. They may take a lot of resources and deploy them rapidly without measuring what they do, without actual real accountability to the recipients or to each other and without a view toward transitioning that to longer term developmental strategies. But it has to be all of those things, right? So if aid is gonna really work, it has to be measurable, replicable, coordinated, appropriate, and also translate to long term uh, um, operations. My, uh, my first foray in the humanitarian field was in Somalia. I worked globally before that, but in the 1992-93, during the Black Hawk Down era, I worked in Somalia, and I found it to be the most challenging place I've ever seen, and even seen since. It was dangerous and hot and difficult. The populations had tremendous needs. There were huge groups of people that were left affected and not being served, and, uh, and it was just simply a dangerous place to be. But what impressed me the most, actually, is the, that there was no plan. Like, there were a lot of organizations working, and a lot of organizations trying to do things, but there was not a not a plan and not a goal for 
uh, at least in the overall respect to serving the population. And it kind of shocked me. And so after working in the aid industry in you know, 30 countries thereafter, I just realized that the aid industry was not built to coordinate and to measure and to use evidence. And it needed to change. And so I really decided that I thought academics had something to do with that. And that's why in 2005 I started the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. HHI is a university-wide program, so we work with the schools of law and business and government and, of course, medicine and public health and others to look at a multidisciplinary way of assisting the aid community to do it better. So my final point is that um, improving aid requires a strategic approach. And if we're going to improve the humanitarian aid industry, this really complicated $25 billion a year industry, um, and especially if we're going to do it from our small ish footprint from Harvard, we need to pick strategic things to do and strategic ways that we can influence and change and to some degree transform the aid industry. And so I'll pick two. And uh, I have a, we have a few ideas at HHI, but I'll pick a couple. Um, one of them is the uh, humanitarian academy, in other words, training uh, humanitarian aid workers to understand it as a unique, unique discipline and then to move to um, creating humanitarian assistance as its own professional pathway. As a physician, I go to medical school. I went to medical school. I eked into the clinical space. I eventually uh, was tortured in residency into uh, becoming a, a, what I hope, competent physician. And then I was launched off into the world. But that allows the translation from um, research from the bench to the bedside. But the humanitarian aid industry doesn't have such a thing, right? There's no real understanding of the evidence base and the translation of it into the field. So in creating a humanitarian academy, it, I hope to create a home that we can educate the next generation of humanitarian aid workers and make them accountable to evidence and accountable to each other. And then the, the second big issue that we're focusing on is transformative technologies in the humanitarian sphere. In other words, how can we use open source data collection that is available to all organizations and encourage them to do it and encourage the NGOs and the UN together to adopt it so that they will not collect information and retreat to design their programs, but collect information and share it among themselves to make a, a wider understanding of what's going on in the field. So we've just launched a, a program called Kobo Toolbox that's been uh, adopted by the UN as their central data collection platform, and it's being adopted by 70 NGOs to do just that. So um, I'll conclude by saying, you know, I'm a perpetual optimist. You have to be to be in this field. Um, and, uh, and I see great promise in not only the, the aid world and what it can become, that it's not, but also in the role of, of Harvard as a powerful institution and in bringing multidisciplinary studies and expertise to it. So thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Okay. <clears throat> so I have one, one quick question, and that is, is there any existing clearinghouse now. So in an area where there's conflict and there's need for aid, is there a central clearinghouse where the various NGOs and organizations can work through to avoid duplication or you know, cross purposes? And, or is it just not possible to do that? There, there's been great um, strides in advancing the humanitarian aid kind of world. Um, in their ability to coordinate. It's called the UN cluster system. And so since the, the Southeast Asian tsunami, 2004, I want to say, or several years ago, um, the, uh, the UN cluster system came to be, and it allows health organizations to talk to other health organizations, shelter organizations to talk to each other, to do that in Geneva beforehand, and also to do it in the field. So it exists, but there is not, and they have not yet until recently adopted a way to actually collect and share data together. So one of the big innovations is going to be to, to help the cluster system do its work by also collecting data, sharing data, and make it available to each other, to other UN agencies, and even to people like the ministries of health and local govern, governments. Ashish, did you have a question? No. OK. So we will then move on to the next speaker. And we'll have plenty of time for questions at the end. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Andy Elner. I've had the privilege of working with Andy over the last three years in his role as co-director of the HMS Center for Primary Care. He's also director of the program in Global Primary Care and Social Change at Harvard Medical School. Associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. 
and uh, innovation consultant at the Phyllis Jen Center for Primary Care, where he teaches primary care medicine and occasionally practices primary care medicine. Uh, his work focuses on the redesign of health service delivery and medical training to incorporate advances in information technology to hasten the adoption of higher functioning organizational models and better address the social determinants of health. He previously worked within the World Health Organization and the Clinton HIV AIDS Initiative on projects to improve health systems in low and middle income countries. And he serves on the boards of several nonprofit organizations focused on primary care and community health. Happened to have graduated from Harvard College and Harvard Medical School, and we'll turn it over to Andy. Thanks so much, Jeff, for the, for the kind words. Um, and, and my thanks as well to, to you and President Nabel and, and Dean Frank for this invitation. Uh, it's really a delight to be here. I have to say, it's, um, it's intimidating enough to sort of sit up here in the middle of the stage with the bright lights uh, uh, on me, but to, to have to go after someone who flies into war-torn <laughs> countries uh, uh, and brings order to, to situations yeah. of total chaos, I, I feel like is maybe too much to ask, but I'm, I'm gonna do the best I can. <laughs> Um, uh, as, as Jeff mentioned, when I'm, when I'm not um, having fun conversations with brilliant and inspiring people like uh, my co-panelists and, and, and our moderator today, uh, I am a, a primary care doctor um, uh, every, uh, every Tuesday and Thursday, uh, so, so not just uh, more, more than a little bit, um, about a, a quarter of a mile uh, this way, um, I see my patients in clinic. Um, and, and every other day of the week, um, and, and not infrequently in the, in the, in the wee uh, witching hours of, of the early morning, um, I find myself obsessing um, uh, about what could be going wrong with them um, uh, and how I can um, uh, make and, and keep them healthy. Um, and I, I would say at the, at the risk of sounding uh, a, a little sentimental or perhaps hyperbolic, um, practic practicing primary care medicine uh, in Boston in 2013 sometimes feels a little uh, like uh, being in Dickens, London. Um, uh, and uh, I'll say what I mean. I I I'll spare you the, um, the more cliche uh, first line of, of the tale of two cities, um, but I'll, I'll remind you of the, of the bit that comes after. Uh, it was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. Um, and, and so here's what I mean. I, I can have um, days in clinic like I had um, just a few weeks ago uh, where I will see a new patient uh, in uh, total crisis who's lost uh, 40 pounds over the last year, has uh, diffuse pain all over his body. Um, and within a matter of weeks, um, using the most advanced imaging technology in the world and, and blood tests and other things, I can uh, and, and did diagnose him with uh, a rare blood disorder um, and connect him with some of the world's leading experts uh, in that condition um, who can help him to access um, uh, uh, treatments that will dramatically impact uh, the quality and length of his life. Um, it's an extraordinary experience. On the same day, um, I can see a patient um, as I did um, uh, a, a woman who, uh, whom I see regularly and have known for a, for a long time, a single mother um, uh, who works two jobs uh, and still struggles to afford her insulin uh, and put healthy food on the table. And um, still, despite both of our, 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 both F, uh, our best intentions, uh, every time we see each other, um, has uh, dramatically uncontrolled uh, diabetes and, and high blood pressure. Um, putting her at, um, at great risk uh, within a matter of a decade or two of being in, in Mike's emergency room, of, of, of strokes, heart attacks, uh, blindness, uh, and other things. Um, and so there's this, um, this profound um, dissonance uh, that, that I feel like I experience uh, on a regular basis as a, as a primary care clinician here. We've taken um, just I incredible um, uh, ingenuity and creativity um, and applied it to biomedical uh, discovery, to clinical science, um, and we can do absolutely um, amazing things for people. Um, but we have, I would say, yet to apply that same kind of uh, incredible creativity uh, and ingenuity to addressing um, what are arguably some of the more fundamental or important barriers to, to many of our patients' health. 
And those are barriers like um, access to and motivation to eat uh, healthy foods and to exercise regularly. Um, uh, difficulty navigating our incredibly complex uh, and, and fragmented healthcare system, unsafe living conditions, et cetera. Um, and, and so there's this, this dissonance that I think we all experience on a, on a regular basis um, as clinicians here. Um, uh, and, and so in addition to when I'm up in the middle of the night obsessing about my patients, um, I also obsess about um, oh, what, what are the changes um, that we need to take um, to, to, to really start to address um, some of these more fundamental barriers and uh, create a healthcare system um, uh, that, that uh, dramatically improves um, the health that we produce for, for what we spend on it. Um, and here's what I've concluded. We need to change almost everything. <laughs> um, and, and specifically, we, we need to change um, uh, who does what in the healthcare system, um, uh, when care happens, uh, where care happens, how we use information technology to, to communicate, um, uh, to coordinate what we do, and to understand um, how to improve what we do on a much more rapid basis. Um, and uh, Ashish can speak much more articulately to this than, than I can, but also how, how we pay for care in a way that actually incentivizes the kind of creativity um, in the delivery of care and the organization of care that would actually produce dramatically better outcomes at, lo at lower costs. Um, and it's really um, my experience in global health that's been uh, uh, my greatest source of, of inspiration about what is actually possible when you uh, fundamentally rethink things. Because um, there's all of these examples uh, from around the world of, of what's possible in places uh, where there are almost no resources and literally no doctors. Um, but as Jeff referred to, where we're achieving uh, extraordinarily better um, outcomes for, for, for much, much lower cost. And I have time just to give uh, a couple uh, quick examples, and I'm going to use it as a way of, of illustrating, I think, what, what I think are, are sort of fundamental uh, principles to, to, to rethinking uh, what we do in healthcare. Um, the first principle is um, people are capable of far more than we sometimes give them credit for if we can just remove some of the simple and obvious barriers um, to, to, to helping them. Um, and I guess the, the most dramatic example is, and it, it's shocking to even think about this, um, but literally 15 years ago, um, in rooms like this, um, in panel discussions like this, people were having serious debates, and I'm looking at Paul, because I, I think he was probably in Haiti at this point, but people were having ser serious debates about whether it was feasible and made sense to treat people with antiretrovirals in, in poor countries around the world. Um, and, and Paul was in Haiti proving that this was possible, but people were having serious discussions. Was this cost effective, number one? But also, um, you know, there was, this is um, uh, sort of an, an unfortunate statement that a U.S. government official made at the time uh, to, be, to be unnamed. Um, but but this, this person said, you know, pe people in Africa don't wear watches. Um, uh, and so they, they, they're not able to tell the time and they, they, they won't be able to adhere um, to, to their medical regimens. Uh, and that was the kind of sort of r ridiculous thinking that was going on at the time. Now, 15 years later, um, and millions and millions of, of, of lives saved, um, we know that actually people in Africa adhere to antiretroviral regimens at almost, at more than twice the rate, uh, or almost twice the rate of people in, in North America. Um, and the, the, one of the really interesting studies that was done to try to understand why that was, why that was the case was um, by Norma Ware from our department uh, at, at the medical school. Um, and the study showed that it was, it was actually, uh, it was an ethnographic study to understand what was explaining this dramatically better adherence. And it was, it was the connection between people um, people felt, felt a responsibility to their family members, to their close-linked community, to their caregivers, um, to, to adhere to their medicines. They, thought, they felt like there was uh, no alternative not to. It was the social capital that they had and the co connectivity. So people are capable of doing uh, far more than I think we sometimes give them credit for. Um, second point. Um, we need to fundamentally rethink who does what in the healthcare system. And I, I know Ashish is also going to talk about this, so I'm going to be particularly brief uh, in, in, in my discussion. And, and I'm, I'm going to assume that pretty much everyone in this room knows 
the, dr uh, the dramatic uh, health outcomes that have been achieved uh, through uh, health systems that have been built on a backbone of community health workers, uh, both by governments around the world, but also by uh, nonprofit organizations like Partners in Health or uh, BRAC in, in, in Bangladesh. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary example, but there, there are actually many other examples of places where non-physicians uh, are, are performing just as well or better um, than, than, than others at a far lower cost. And uh, you know, there's examples in various places of clinical officers um, doing uh, uh, cesarean sections uh, at, at a high quality. And, and we can go on and on. I think Ashish is gonna talk more about this. Um, but I think there's a tremendous amount to, to, to gain by, by fundamentally rethinking who does what and then putting them in organizational models that are actually where there's a good management infrastructure um, and they're actually well designed to, to, to perform um, uh, in, in reality and not just principle. Uh, final, final point. Um, I don't have a Rick Perry moment here. Uh, we, we need to think, uh, rethink when and where healthcare happens. Um, I, I think uh, largely in response to a more um, uh, 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 previous century uh, where healthcare systems were built around infectious disease um, and reactive models where people came to the clinics uh, and came to the hospitals when they, they, they got sick. That's what we have now, also a financing model that incentivizes this. Um, but as, as Jeff mentioned, as uh, around the world, not just in this country, but in settings around the world, uh, we really transitioned to a largely um, chronic disease um, uh, epidemiologic burden where what people do in their lives uh, has a far greater impact on their health than anything we as uh, clinicians can, can do for them in, in the clinic. We need to really rethink uh, an approach that relies on people to coming, coming to us uh, and be much more proactive. And again, there's, there's, there's great models. Um, there's community health workers who go out to, to people's homes. There's uh, many examples in, uh, around the world in, in low-income settings of, play, of ways in which information technology uh, is being used in very innovative ways to connect people in, in villages with community health workers with their care delivery system. Um, one example, an uh, MD, uh, PhD student uh, that I work with, Scott Lee, is uh, involved with a trial in India right now um, that's using uh, a mobile technology, smartphones, uh, to provide community health workers with uh, much better information uh, about their performance in uh, helping their clients to uh, manage uh, chronic diseases in the home. And so they actually have great performance metrics in, in the palm of their hand that's helping them to understand how they're doing, how they can get better, and providing them incentive uh, to, to provide excellent care. And I can tell you, as a provider uh, here, I don't have that kind of data uh, right, right now uh, about the work that I'm doing. Um, and, and so I, I think it, there's, and we could, we could go on and on, but I only have seven minutes, so um, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna end quickly. But I think there's all these uh, sort of wonderful examples that um, provide um, me with uh, tremendous uh, hope and inspiration when I am up in the middle of the night obsessing about how we're gonna do a better job uh, to, to, to take care of the people that we, that we care about, which is our whole society. Um, uh, and the reality is that we're, I think we're, we're at just starting to see some of that really exciting innovation happen here, especially as some of the policy uh, and payment changes ch uh, uh, are coming into effect to incentivize uh, the provision of high value care. Um, so I think uh, there, there's this tremendous opportunity. And part of this is, is moving uh, away from this idea. I think there's still this popular notion that um, global health, uh, there's a directionality, there's a gradient that goes from uh, wealthy countries to, to less wealthy countries um, about uh, ideas and knowledge and things like this. And um, uh, Nigel Crisp has been uh, one of the really um, thoughtful people to, to write about this. Um, but really rethinking uh, the, the use of that gradient um, and, and starting to, to see global health as this really important opportunity uh, to learn from each other in a multi-directional way about how we actually um, provide uh, the most health uh, at the most sustainable cost and, and the best uh, experience for our patients. Um, so I'll, I'll conclude um, just, just by circling back. I, I, I made the statement earlier that we need to uh, change almost everything uh, uh, about, about healthcare, and I argue that we need to change 
um, who, who does what in the healthcare system and, and when and where care happens and some other fundamental things to enable um, uh, creative innovation. Um, but I wanted to conclude by saying uh, the, the thing that I think we absolutely uh, must not change about healthcare. Um, because, and I think this is not just uh, uh, an issue for a, a primary care doctor, but it's really an issue for all health providers, which is that I think one of, probably the highest value thing uh, about healthcare is relationships um, and, the, and the connection uh, between people. And I think too often when we talk about innovation and we, we think about these very fundamental disruptive changes that we need to make in healthcare, and people begin to think, wow, um, uh, the technology is going to replace the people. And, you know, um, and I, I think that's 100% the wrong way to think about things. I think that if, if this innovation is successful, um, what we're going to do is remove a lot of the wasteful things that we do and the low value things. Um, and we're actually going to focus much more on the relationships and the connections, um, picking up on things that might change for people uh, much, much earlier. Um, because we're connected in a more, a more sophisticated way. Um, and it's really going to be uh, a healthcare system uh, that achieves dramatically better uh, 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 impact and outcomes based not just on being well organized uh, and being innovative and cutting edge, um, but, but most importantly on the relationships and the social connectivity we have with each other and, and with our patients. So Andy, maybe I'll just ask you one question. So from your perspective as co-director of the HMS Center for Primary Care, what are you seeing, if anything, in terms of the, the attitudes of our students coming into the medical profession today? You know, what's their appetite for some of these concepts that you talk about, changes in the way they practice, uh, team-based care, et cetera? Are, are you seeing a change, and how is it coming about? Thanks, Sophie. Yeah, that, that's one of the other things that actually gives me hope and inspiration in the, in the middle of the night. Um, one of the best parts of my job is actually working with the students. And uh, I, I think it's really relevant to be talking about primary care in a, at, a, at a global health conference um, be, because it really I think they're, they're, uh, they belong in the, in the same uh, set of uh, concepts and understandings. And the students who are incredibly excited uh, about global health um, and probably more than the, uh, the vast majority of students coming into medical school say that they have um, some interest and experience in global health. Um, but they also understand that um, what a big part of what global health is is this creative uh, reimagining of what we can do uh, uh, for, for patients when we uh, fundamentally rethink the delivery of care, how we use technology, et cetera. And they're really, what our, one of our main strategies, as you know, Jeff, for, for the center is to try to let the students lead. Uh, and so we have a student leadership committee, and uh, we really listen to them. Uh, we have a um, challenge grant opportunity where students propose innovations uh, to implement at community health centers. Um, and what they're coming up with is absolutely, it's, it's awesome. And I think the, the reality is they're much more capable of thinking out of the box um, than we are because they've never been in the box. Um, uh, and, and, and so that's one of the, uh, I think that, when, when, when I focus on them, it's all hope and, and no despair. Okay. And you have to stop waking up and worrying in the middle of <laughs> yeah. the night. We, <laughs> no. I want to do something about that. <laughs> Integrating sleep medicine more into <laughs> care is, is something I'm very interested okay, in. Okay. Thank you. So we're now going to move on to the third panelist, uh, Ashish Jha, professor of medicine at the Brigham and Women's Hospital and professor of health policy and management at the Harvard School of Public Health. Ashish is himself a graduate of Harvard Medical School did his medical training at UCSF, was chief resident over there, returned to Boston to get his MPH at the Harvard School of Public Health, once again showing the interrelationship of these various organizations that are convening today. A practicing internist with a clinical focus on hospital care, his main research interests include the impact of public policy on the health care delivery system with a focus on quality, costs of care, the role of health information technology, and driving improvements in care, and the question of how organizational leadership affects the delivery of safe, effective, and efficient care. And I'll say we're also very good buddies on Twitter, sharing <laughs> insights uh, almost every day. Absolutely. Ashish. Jeff, thank you very much. And, and uh, in the interest of making sure there's plenty of time for discussion, I'll keep my remarks relatively brief. But I'm going to start off with a clinical story. So imagine a 70-year-old man um, develops chest pain, 
goes on for weeks, um, gets progressively worse, and finally he's had it, or his spouse has had it, um, and he goes to the hospital. Now, I too was going to start with a tale of two cities, but since you started there already, <laughs> Andy. Um, so let's imagine uh, in the first scenario that he lives outside of Bangalore, India. He's a farmer who's retired, and he goes to Narayana Hospital. There, he gets diagnosed with three-vessel coronary artery disease, and it's recommended that he get cardiac surgery. He needs a cabbage. In that scenario, in 2013, he will probably have to pay about fifteen to eighteen hundred dollars for that cardiac surgery. If he were a seventy-year-old man in Boston, he would have Medicare, and Medicare would reimburse whichever hospital he chose to go, somewhere in the thirty to forty thousand dollar range, depending on if it was an academic medical center. And if he had private insurance, the reimbursement might be actually quite substantially higher. Okay, so big price differential, right? Fifteen hundred bucks. $40,000. But what about outcomes? Well, at Narayana Hospital, Devi Shetty, who's the CEO who runs it, uh, says his 30-day mortality rate's about 1%. If you look across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, the mortality rate after cardiac surgery is about 1%. Now, I I'm not trying to make a comparison that those are equal. I don't know. There's been no good studies. We don't know if the patient populations are comparable. We don't know if one patient population is sicker than the other, but from a first blush you get a sense that the outcomes are pretty similar and the costs are dramatically different. And this, when, and there are literally dozens of examples like this, when people look at examples like this, they get very, very excited, right? Because healthcare costs are posing a substantial burden to our society, um, they're making us uh, enter into a whole series of social trade-offs that we'd rather not make. And people think, well, why can't we do it just the way Narayana does it? If we can figure out how to deliver cardiac surgery for $1,500, isn't, that, isn't there a big win there? And what I'm going to try to do over the next few minutes is make a few key points. First, this is much harder than it looks, because a lot of what differentiates Narayana from, let's say, Brigham and Women's Hospital is prices. I'll come back to what that means in a second. The second is that it's not just about prices, and there really are opportunities to learn, and I'll try to explain what those are. Um, third, I'll try to describe a little bit about why I am optimistic that I think over time, um, models like Narayana actually will drive change in the US healthcare system. And fourth, I'll talk very briefly about what places like the Brigham and Harvard and academic medical centers and universities can do. So let's talk about prices. So what differentiates the $1,500 cardiac surgery from the $40,000 cardiac surgery? It's almost every part of the surgery, we're just paying much higher prices at the Brigham. So if you want to figure out how to pay your cardiac surgeons 90% less, you could substantially lower your, your costs of, of cardiac surgery. It's going to be pretty hard to get any cardiac surgeon to take a 90% pay cut. Um, so one big part of it is prices, right? Input prices on every single thing. And and we know this from, from all the literature that people have looked at. The reason why U.S. healthcare spending is about twice the European average, almost all of it is driven by prices. We don't necessarily do that much more. Everything is just twice as expensive. And so that poses a very different set of challenges for how you lower healthcare costs and why the Narayana model isn't easy to transport and just plug into the U.S. healthcare system. But as I said, my second point was it's not just about prices. So what else is there? And when you listen to people like Devi Shetty, and I'm going to use Narayana for this, you can talk about the Arvind Institute when you talk about cataract surgery. There are a lot of examples, but let's stick with cardiac surgery for a second. Um, he describes what, what it takes to be an efficient provider of cardiac surgery. One of his points is volume. So his thinking is that the average hospital that provides cardiac surgery should be between two and 3,000 beds in size. The average hospital in the US is about 100 beds, and the average hospital in the US that does cardiac surgery is about 200 beds. So why is volume so important? Because hospitals are high fixed cost places, right? Every hospital has to have a blood bank, a pharmacy, a radiology suite. To the extent that you can spread those costs 
across a lot more patients, you can, you can substantially lower the spending on each individual patient. We have very few institutions that are that size. That's exactly the kinds of stuff that, that Narayana is building and other institutions in, in India and other places are building, is these massive complexes that can really substantially change their cost structure by basically spreading out their fixed costs. So volume is one. The second is task shifting, and Andy has talked about this, but they spend a tremendous amount of time thinking about what are things that only the surgeon can do? And what are things that physician assistants can do? And nurses can do? And what are things that patients and families can do? So now this is a notion that gets people a little weirded out when you hear about it first, but at a lot of these places, they train family members to change dressings and do other things that we traditionally think of as nursing tasks. Now, when I describe that, people think, well, is that safe? Is that hygienic? Is that good? What's interesting is you have to ask yourself, is it better for a patient to have his dressing changed by a nurse who sees six patients or by a family member who's there in the room the whole time and is not interacting with all the other bugs in the hospital? And the clinical outcomes would suggest that actually the patients do just as well and maybe even better when it's their own family member changing dressing with adequate training. Is that gonna happen tomorrow at, in American hospitals? Almost surely not. But it's, it's in, in Narayana, is born out of necessity. Uh, but it's the kind of out-of-box thinking where you say, how do we actually get patients and families to do more? How do we get everybody in the healthcare system to behave differently and act differently and do more than they were doing before? And that becomes a substantial source of, of savings and innovation. And then the last part that I'm gonna mention is thinking about how to be frugal with the, with the fixed costs that they have. Um, I flew in, actually I was in India yesterday, I flew in. Um, so on my flight, as I was getting on a plane uh, from Delhi to London, um, I asked, it was a 747, I asked the flight attendant how old the plane was. She said she didn't know, she was a little concerned about why I was asking. <laughs> I had no concerns about the plane, it felt, looked perfectly safe. Um, but it was a 747 and she said she thought it was about 20 years old. You know, we fly planes that are 30 years old all the time. And we don't worry about it. We don't even usually know about it. Most, most radiology, most um, diagnostic companies stop supporting things like CT scans and MRIs after six to eight years and say, we won't do maintenance on it anymore. You have to buy a new one. It's safe to fly a 30-year-old plane, but not safe to use a CT scanner that's six years old or eight years old. Um, you know, when I trained in the, in, 10, 15 years ago, we had CAT scans. They work really well. Um, I don't think that the technology has changed so much. And for places like Narayana, they make trade-offs. They say, we won't get the 64 slice CT because we're not sure it's really worth it. We'll use a 15 or 20 year old CT scanner. We'll just get a Chinese company to, to service it. Literally, that's what they've done. Found a company in China that was willing to service it because GE was no longer willing to support that, that CAT scan. So the point becomes that when you listen to someone like Devi Shetty, he says, yeah, right now we do cardiac surgery for 1,800 bucks. That still leaves 90% of India unable to afford it. So my goal is to get to $500. So how do you do that? And that poses an entire new set of challenges for them, going from 1,500 to $500. All right, so let's think about how some of this stuff plays out in the US and what the opportunities are. Well, under the Affordable Care Act, I think one of the things we are gonna see is we are already seeing is price cuts, I mean price cuts, payment cuts to hospitals, more price pressures, um, to the extent that we can have more competition in the system, and this is a place where some of us worry that we're not gonna have adequate competition, but to the extent that we have more competition in the marketplace, you're gonna force organizations to be more innovative and more creative. One of the things that's worked in other industries in keeping prices low is outsourcing, which is really generally hard to do in healthcare. And people talk about medical tourism all the time, but not a lot of patients are willing to get on a plane and switch in London and go all the way to India to get their cardiac surgery. So Narayana, for instance, is building the health city in the Cayman Islands. And I looked it up just before I came over here. JetBlue, four hours, direct flight, Boston to Cayman Islands, 600 bucks. But that's because it's December, and it's, it's, uh, if you'd plan it out, I'm sure you can get it for less than that. But the bottom line, is that when you have places that are relatively close by providing very good outcomes and prices that are 60, 70, 80% cheaper 
that will put price pressures on hospitals and healthcare organizations in the US. And I think we're gonna see that beginning to happen more and innovation beginning to happen more. Um, and then finally, uh, I think a key issue is the scope of practice laws that we have across uh, really every state in the country that very strongly defines what a doctor can do, what a nurse can do, what a PA can do. You know, these things are not codified in law, or they should not be codified in law. We need to be much more dynamic about them. What we need to do is measure outcomes, and if we can achieve good outcomes, changing the roles of providers, it doesn't matter. We have to have that flexibility. We generally don't have that. And when I say this in audiences, almost everybody seems to agree with this, and doctors say, yeah, you know, our scope of practice rules are very, very important, but nurses, they should be much more flexible. And when I talk in front of nurses, they talk about how doctors need to be more flexible. We all need to be much more flexible about what these jobs are, what they mean, what each of us can do, and how we work together as teams. Final point is thinking about academics and, and what places like Harvard and the Brigham and, and, uh, can do. You are gonna hear a tremendous amount of both hope and excitement, but also a lot of hype about frugal innovation, learning from other countries. One of the things that we need to do as, as academics is be brokers of information and data to study these models very, very carefully. It's hard enough to get the BI to learn from Mass General. The idea that we're gonna get hospitals in America to learn from Narayana is not a no-brainer, it's not a given. We really need to understand in far more detailed ways how people are achieving these great efficiencies and which of those lessons actually apply here and could actually work here within our culture. That kind of work isn't gonna happen anywhere outside of academia, anywhere outside of places like Harvard. And so Harvard becomes both the source of learning and the source of information and data that really helps us make good decisions. I'll finish off with the final point. Dean Frank often says uh, that the Affordable Care Act is arguably the most important healthcare reform effort the world has seen in a generation. What I have learned in the last six months or a year as I have traveled to a variety of countries is the whole world is paying attention to the ACA, right? And not just on the insurance expansion part, but on the delivery system part. And what's interesting to me is as I watch the way countries are reacting and as I look at our own struggles to figure out how to deliver better care, cheaper and more efficiently, I've never felt more optimistic that there is really an opportunity for cross-national learning. People are much more open to thinking about what are better ways of delivering care. And we can be the translators of that information. And I think we have an obligation to do so. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Okay, I think we'll open it up to the audience to ask questions of any of the panelists. So please uh, feel free to get up, go to a microphone, introduce yourself and ask the question. Hi, I'm Sarah Feldman, I'm a GYN oncologist, and my area of interest is cervical cancer and cervical cancer prevention globally. And I wanted to comment on how we bring those lessons back here to the United States, because there's enormous resistance nationally to what we can learn. I did have the privilege of going to Rwanda, where's Larry, someplace in here, anyways, Rwanda this um, last year to teach cervical cancer prevention there. And while I was there, I learned that they have the most um, evidence-based cervical cancer prevention program anywhere. They've you know, vaccinated 92% of their uh, young girls through their school-based programs, and they have a truly evidence-based cervical cancer screening and prevention program. So when I came back, I was invited to one of our national guidelines committees here for underserved populations in the United States. And I was the head of the cytology, pap smear, and colposcopy group. So I said after we reviewed all the evidence, I don't think we should be doing this. Let's do what they're doing in Rwanda. How did that work? <laughs> <laughs> and the voices in the room dropped, because our whole conference was how we were gonna make sure that people got PAPs and colposcopy in the Samoa Islands and God knows where else in all these underserved places. And I said, not only do I think we should do this in the underserved places, this is what we should be doing for everybody. This is the evidence. So the World Health Organization just came out with guidelines to do exactly that, and supported the evidence to do what they're doing in Rwanda. But I just got off a conversation with our national cohort, you know, guideline people, and I said, I got on a little late because I just finished seeing a patient at the data farm, but this is important. And so I got on, 
and they're all talking about how they're going to study all the retrospective paps and colposcopies we've been doing. And I said to them, as I've said many times before, we need to be proactive, trying new, less expensive opportunities where we can have patients screening themselves with HPV self-collected you know, things, and we need to study this. We need a national database. There were some unhappy people on that phone conversation. So here's my question for the group. I agree that there are cost problems and there are all sorts of scaling problems and things like that, but there are also good practices that are evidence-based, that are hard for our American colleagues to hear, both because they don't understand some of the evidence, they don't all understand how to read it, they don't understand that what we've been doing for many years may not be the best thing going forward, and they don't understand at all the issue of cost that it's, sometimes it's just a matter of billing and different numbers. But if you do too many tests, it costs more. But unless the outcomes are better, we shouldn't be doing it. But I'm telling you, that is not well understood in the United States. So this is my question for this panel. How do we, cha how do we channel back or, or transfer back some of the good practices that some of our countries that have never done it before, therefore are getting it right because they're really looking at the evidence? How do we bring that back here? How do we communicate that? How do we get people to understand that if you, you know, vaccinate every boy with no decidable outcome, you take money away from or HPV vaccinated every boy with no discernible outcome, you take money away from cervical cancer screening in the middle of Alabama or someplace where we have known problems. So that's my question. Thank you. I can, I can start um, because I think a lot of this, this is about culture, right? Um, and we've been sort of acculturated and professionalized um, uh, in, a, in a certain way, um, and it supports a very rigid hierarchy and a, 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 a sort of way of, of thinking that has nothing to do with cost um, and had very little to do with think, you know, rethinking sort of who does what, um, kind of organizational innovation in the system. Um, and, you know, changing culture is one of the, the, you know, I think the hardest things to do. People at business school, they're people who, that's what they study all, all the time. Um, and there's a couple of sort of key elements. One is a, a sense of crisis um, and, and a real sort of motivation to change. And I'm not sure that um, people are, are feeling it yet, but I think they probably will soon. I think that, that was part of Ashish's point in, in bringing up the Cayman Islands I example. But I think when people actually feel their income might, might be really threatened, um, uh, they may quickly change. Um, but I think that there's um, a, a, a better way um, to create this kind of change. And it, um, I, I think it's likely going to involve the, uh, the students, if they're, they're in the room here, and the trainees. Because I think they haven't been acculturated um, uh, in the ways that, that, that many of us have, in the ways of thinking. And I, I think they, they get it. Um, uh, and as they um, sort of travel through the system, uh, they're going to provide an important motivation um, for, uh, and, and start setting an example to people uh, to be open to, to this, uh, this kind of change. But it's, it, I mean, it's the hardest thing to change is, is culture, especially when power is involved. Anyone else? The only other thing I would say is, as I suggested, it's hard to take lessons from Geisinger Health System and, and get almost anybody else to, to, to apply that to themselves. Um, it's, it's 10 times harder to take it from Rwanda or India. And, and you know, change, change is hard. Change becomes easier when the financial system's rewarded. I mean, right now, it's hard to get people to say, do less of this if your income depends on doing more of it. Um, but if your income depends on figuring out how to do this efficiently, you're much more open to that conversation. So I think payment systems have a profound effect, and leadership has a profound effect on culture. Those are the two things that I think of as the things that really, over time, can affect culture. And culture is what you need to change in order to have people be willing to, to try these new innovative models. Any other quick questions? Paul, you were standing by the microphone, but then you sat down. Well, because Sarah really already got at the heart of this, I just want to say one thing about Rwanda and then ask um, you know, if, if there's time for uh, thoughts about it, it you know, culture, is, as she said, is, is awfully hard, both, all three of you said it's awfully hard to change. But, of course, what we're describing in Rwanda was very rapid change. I mean, Rwanda was the poorest country on the face of the earth in 1994. And, uh, and these changes that Jeff described in his opening are really 
been picked up great speed over the last 10 years, which is very, very short. Any anthropologist will tell you that culture change you know, uh, uh, of that scale must be driven by um, something other than attitudinal shifts inside, and as you just said, as she said, uh, you know, incentives and leadership. But um, knowing that, uh, and I ask Andy this question all the time, so you'll forgive me. I'm, it's, I'm asking it every month in the hope that you're going to give me a different answer. <laughs> um, the switch, you know, talking about uh, cost um, is not the same thing as talking about price. And uh, costs are socially constructed, but prices are, are wildly and extravagantly socially constructed, right? I mean, you've seen the, the literature, you mentioned the example on, of a cabbage. Um, and effectiveness, of course, is also socially constructed. What we define as effective, you know, in one year may be different. And I'm just wondering where, you, and you know, you take a, you know, trauma care, like what Mike is talking about, you know, it, it, it is going to be expensive, whether it's done at the Brigham or in Haiti, or, I mean, there, there are high investments in, in certain kinds of services, uh, high uh, cost, and of course, high prices. Um, I wonder if moving away from the notion of something being expensive and not very good, uh, towards the, the, the notion of something being effective, how, how is that going, do you think, now, right now in primary care, as in today, as compared to six months ago? Um, and I say primary care not excluding uh, emergency or humanitarian, uh, uh, the situations that, that uh, Mike's described, but surely there's rapid change happening here, and if so, how do we feel it, and how, 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 is, it, how, how is it progressing just over the last few months? Yeah. All in two seconds or less. Right. The short <laughs> answers. Um, so uh, just to be very brief, I, I, I think it is changing uh, very rapidly. Um, and I think the change is accelerating. And I think probably the most important issue is, is change in payment um, and uh, payment that, you know, value-based payments are attempting to think about incentivizing the effectiveness uh, relative to the cost and not just pay uh, fee-for-service for more, more services done. Um, and I think we are, uh, a lot of the principles that I mentioned, Ashish and Mike m mentioned, um, we're starting to see them in, in the change in what people are doing, and specifically the, the who does what thing, or you know, global health, it's called task shifting. Uh, in local uh, conversations, it's called practicing at the top of your license. Um, but when people talk about the patient-centered medical home or you know, other sort of types of changes in primary care, it's a lot about making, uh, taking a rational approach to thinking about who does who does what, um, and really just having physicians do physicians' work and empowering people uh, and patients to do what they're capable of doing. And we're, we're, we're seeing those changes um, uh, almost on a day-to-day -day basis now. Um, and I think that probably a combination of changing payments uh, uh, and, and, and culture, and maybe ultimately um, one thing that we, I think we've, we haven't talked about yet on this panel is, is the expectations of patients and the public. Um, and I think that it, in the past, people have really perceived that, you know, if your CT scanner is, is, uh, is, is six years old, that's low quality care. Um, uh, and what they want when they have shoulder pain is an MRI. Um, and it's, I've never totally understood this because Americans know what service is. Um, uh, so why do they accept um, uh, really poor um, service and health care when they demand it in every other part of their care? And I think people are going to start seeing examples of um, you know, m just a totally different experience as patients, um, and that hopefully will help to accelerate this shift to effectiveness um, uh, and, and not so much a focus on just cost cutting. Very quick, quick point. Um, I think one of the notions you got at Paul is, is it is absolutely critical if we're gonna figure out how to do this stuff better to measure outcomes, and I say outcomes what do patients care about is clearly outcomes. What do we as clinicians also care about are, are, are outcomes in a, in a real live time way and then do a lot more experimentation. I think one of the things that is a fallacy is we often say, well, we just sit down and figure out what should people do. I can't figure out what people should do, right? What we need is a series of experiments that says what can doctors do, what can nurses do, what can community health workers do, and try a variety of different models. 
And if you're measuring outcomes and if you're measuring them in real time, time, in real time you can make a lot of progress in innovation much more quickly. That's what places like Narayana does, right? They don't actually have a committee that says, what should doctors be doing? What should community health workers be doing? They actually experiment with a whole lot of different things. And because they're tracking it very closely, they know when something doesn't work and they pull back quickly. It's that willingness to experiment, the willingness to fail, and the willingness to learn from that that we have too little of in healthcare. And until we do that better, um, it's going to be tough to make real improvements. I think we're going to have to stop because there's another part of the program. And thanks to the panelists. And great. Thank you. Ten minutes. Thank you. Yeah, we'll take a ten minute break. Thank you.